Hello, thanks for tuning in. Joe Simhart here again. It's 11.11.23. Uh, this video is going to be a follow-up on one I did on Twin Flames. Uh, and so you can refer back to that. I'll put a link in there. Uh, I'm responding to the Twin Flames again because of a recent uh, Netflix series called Escaping Twin Flames that I saw a couple days ago, I watched all three episodes and it's very good. It's done very well. And a shout out to my colleague, Yanya Lalich, who comes in as an expert who is helping people recover from the uh, experience within that cult. But I want to go a little further than, than other exposés of this particular Twin Flames uh, cult have, have done. There's been a, a two or three. Um, this particular one is called Twin Flames Universe, and it's run by a couple that now calls themselves Jeff and Shalia Devine. Yeah, they changed the name a few times. <laughs> That's not their original name. Here's a picture of them to give you some idea who we're talking about, the Twin Flames Universe. Um, so Jeff and Shalia, who are they? Uh, I'll go into this a little bit. It says on this particular... Uh, TV Guide uh, article online that they are the founders of TFU or Twin Flames University Universe <clears throat> and the couple at the center of it all. Per the series, they present themselves as Twin Flames with a direct line to God who can confirm or deny whether others have found their Twin Flame. And man, do they do a job on the members. Very controlling, um, very narcissistic. In fact, uh, my one note I made after watching the, the series, uh, I, I'll just read it to you. A creepy couple with a greedy, malignant, narcissistic drive to impose their myopic reality on the universe and on you. All right, so what are they imposing here? Well, they're imposing this concept that we have a twin flame that we've been separated from somewhere in eternity. And if we find them, we have to do everything in our power to reunite because that's our goal um, to reach our ascension and to go back into the light or whatever. So this is an old Gnostic theme, but it goes back further than that. It actually goes back to Plato and maybe even beyond Plato. So let's look at this uh, website, which I found, which gives us the origins of it. Um, let's see if you can see this. So yeah, it says uh, it comes from something called Masterclass, Twin Flame Definition and Origins, Three Twin Flame Signs. So I looked at that website, and sure enough, it's another potential rabbit hole down into the Twin Flames universe, a whole different cult version of this. And uh, I wouldn't recommend following Masterclass for anything, but let's see what they say here. So when you look at uh, what is the origin of Twin Flame, well, they have a brief paragraph, which isn't untrue. There are various origins to the theory of the Twin Flame. In the Philosophical Text Symposium, 385 BCE, Plato posits humans once had four legs and arms and two faces. The gods felt threatened by this, so Zeus split the people in two. Humans would wander in search of their other half. Another theory is that the zodiac signs and astrological birth charts determine the attraction between tw twin flames. For example, Aries and Leos might bond because they are both Fire signs. Okay, so you kind of get the idea. This is a new agey, flaky approach to the whole thing. And if you believe in masterclass, welcome to another rabbit hole is how I see it anyway. So let's look at the, the uh, Plato's words, you know, and this is from the Latham's Quarterly, a more scholarly website. And, and here, I'll just give you a glance at it. It says... Uh, you know, Plato's other half, and now love is the name for our pursuit of wholeness. All right, how did this all begin? Well, there's a myth behind it, and it's a myth, okay? But um, so it begins, first you must learn what new human nature was in the beginning and what has happened to it since, because long ago our nature was not what it is now, but very different. So there were three kinds of human beings. That's my first point, not two as there are now, male and female. In addition to these, there was a third, a combination of those. Its name survives, though the kind itself has vanished. At that time, you see the word androgynous really meant something, a form made up of male and fe female elements, though now there's nothing but the word 
and that's used as an insult. So, so the shape was they were completely round, uh, back and sides in a circle, and they had four hands each, as many legs as hands, and two faces exactly alike on a rounded neck. Between the two faces, which were on opposite sides, was one head with four ears. There were two sets of sexual organs and everything else the way you imagined it from what I've told you. They walked upright, as we do now, whatever direction they wanted to. And whenever they set out to run fast, they thrust all of their eight limbs, the ones they had then, and spun rapidly the way gymnastics do, gymnasts do cartwheels by bringing their legs around straight. So this is a monstrous uh, creature that was human, according to this myth. And, um, and anyway, the gods got jealous or whatever and just split it in two and, and spread the sexual organs into where we see them now uh, so that the male half had to go inside the female half and uh, to, to reproduce when they could do that reproduction more like trees reproduce through seed on the ground or whatever. This is what, what it was uh, always claimed. But where does this come from? Well, the Masterclass website says Plato. Well, that's not true. Plato uh, uh, put out a lot of BS mythology in, in his, his things, despite the, the uh, raves we have about Socrates and his wonderful Socratic method and all that, which comes out of Plato. Socrates didn't write anything down, apparently, or very little. Um, so this particular thing comes from the symposium, and in it is this speech given by Aristophanes, included in the symposium, and an aristocrat was born with the name of Aristocles, the Greek philosopher was better known by his nickname Plato because he had these broad shoulders, like a table. Um, so it's Aristophanes who tells the story, not Plato. So Plato has a way, like with his Atlantis myth, of saying it came from someone that was, it was told to someone else and someone named Sophon, and anyway, uh, he doesn't claim he knew it originally, but he's a, like a third removed teller of the story as far as Aristotle. You know, and, and there's other parts of Plato, for instance, his Republic, which is the ideal city-state and how it's supposed to be organized and run. Bertrand Russell in, in the 20th century looked at that and in, in, in the context of, of the rise of, of um, Hitler and, and whatever, and he saw that Plato's Republic was really a formula for fascism. You know, it wasn't any kind of an ideal city. It was set up as an authoritarian control uh, by the elite over the so-called um, defective people. And Plato had a, an answer for them too, which fascists do as well. Uh, get rid of them. So let's go back to this idea of, of the um, origin of the twin flame, you know, which in the Platonic myth, is the splitting apart of this monstrous creature, this human human like creature, into two parts. Neoplatonism probably has as much uh, to do with modern cultism in the New Age as any anything that, that you can trace philosophically. For instance, Neoplatonism informed a lot of theosophy and the theosophical movement because uh, of Plato's idea of the like the the myth of the of the cave where uh, we don't see things as they are we only see things on a wall of shadows that that come from behind us uh, like like uh, two dimensional forms in this world of ours and the real world the world of light is only available to the very enlightened that dare to escape from that uh, world of the, the of the cave of shadows. And, um, and then bring information down to us who are trapped in the cave and tell us what the light is all about. You know, so you get the idea of, of uh, neo-Gnosticism and Gnosticism and, and a lot of cults which claim that the guru has somehow uh, escaped from this bondage of human maya, become enlightened, maybe left their body, uh, traveled to another planet or met some spiritual guide, and then they spout out all this stuff about what the true world, the heaven world is like, and we're supposed to believe it. Um, there are thousands of versions of this other perfect world, and they can't all be true, but people being the narcissists they are, they think if they stumble onto one, like for instance, Twin Flames Universe, they tell themselves 
well, maybe there's something to it. They seem to be helping me. They care about me. Um, maybe it's because I'm missing my other half that I feel so ruined and, and uh, anxious. Um, I'll give it a go. And, and so all the trust is put onto this one particular version of getting the perfect world right. And uh, how many cults have we seen have, have, have done that? So Neoplatonism uh, also informed uh, a form of uh, Judaism and Christianity around the time of the birth of the person we call Jesus. And so uh, out of the Jesus movement, there were, there were dozens of different interpretations of this teacher. And many of them were lumped under the term of Gnostic. And in fact, by the first, second centuries, the Gnostic type cults and, and uh, members outnumbered what we would call proto-Christianity, which was being formed in Rome and became later Roman Christianity and Roman Catholicism, which, which developed a four gospel system and tried to make the uh, or, or create a version of the Christian message that was more reasonable, more adaptable socially. The Gnostic message, which very much was very much like the uh, Platonic message, which is that we live in this fallen world of shadows created by a false god, and we need to escape from it, that the whole thing is wrong. And, um, you know, so that translates psychologically in, in people who believe that because they don't quite fit in, they're anxious, they, their life isn't working well, they've lost their favorite lover, they lost their job, uh, their parents don't like them, they're kind of uh, ill-fitted for society, whatever, you know, people come up with all kinds of excuses that it, it might not be me that's wrong, maybe I'm an indigo child, that I came here from another star system and I'm trapped in this body and I need to find my true self and so you go to this cult, uh, maybe indigo children or maybe the, the Twin Flames universe, and and they will help you expand your true self because this self that you thought you were is an illusion and isn't working, right? <laughs> so, so that's it. So Plato, like I said, can, has been the source of a lot of BS in philosophy and whatever, uh, despite his brilliance. I mean, there's no doubt he's one of the top two or three influential philosophers from the Greek era. Um, Aristotle obviously being the other one. This uh, book will help you to clean up your mind about Neoplatonism and where philosophy can go wrong, as in this twin flame idea. It's called the Plato Cult, and uh, it's, it's uh, written by David Stove, a philosopher and uh, quite a wit. You know, I like his writing, it's fun reading. Uh, the book's been around for quite some time. It came out in 1991, and, and it's a series of essays. It uh, doesn't just concentrate on Plato, but what you'll get from this is, you know, on the flap, what it says is uh, a comment by uh, David Lewis from Princeton University. When philosophers follow where argument leads, too often they are led to doctrines indistinguishable from seer, <clears throat> sorry, indistinguishable from sheer lunacy, and nobody quite notices, you know? And so this remark is, is really interesting. When people get into cults, they, they're like fish put into another pond. The water seems fine, it's water, you know? It feels normal in the beginning, a little more maybe exciting, a little different, a little different temperature or whatever. But, um, you know, it's not the natural water the fish was in. Now it's into another smaller frog pond, so to speak, and it doesn't know that they, it, it's trapped at first. It feels it's in normal water. Um, and it's not until that fish somehow gets out of that pond and gets back into its more natural environment that it can thrive, you know, more naturally and more, more thoroughly and flourish, as Aristotle said. And this is what happens when people get into cults, you know, the Plato cult or whatever, is, is somehow psychologically, and maybe even socially and physically, they remove themselves from their normed wider society, which is making them anxious or they're not having an easy time of it. And they go into this 
uh, pond that feels at, in the beginning like it's going to be a solution to many things. It's, it's more limited but more understandable, uh, even though it's a little mysterious in, in, in the beginning and it has to be explained by the god, the guru, or whatever. But as time goes on, a lot of people that enter into these frog ponds called cults or silos, if you want to call them that, begin to feel constricted, which they are, and they have to find a way of getting out of this mess and getting back into their natural wider environment, which might be a little more risky and, and uh, whatever, but it has a far more potential than being in a cult. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I don't want to drag this on into too many metaphors, but I'd recommend reading this book by Anthony Stove if you've been caught up in in a, a, a kind of a twin flame cult and uh, and looking at the whole idea of twin flames as kind of a bogus myth to illustrate something from ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, yeah, unlike the, the, the Gnostics who said that we were in some light form and a pleroma and originally and we were bonded together as aeons or as spirit male female beings as one being, uh, they had a much more elegant description of this idea of twin flame than Plato's monstrous <laughs> thing that Aristophanes describes. Uh, but it's the same idea, and, and it's really just an idea. Uh, the fact that we can approach in human form our twin flame really destroys that ideal myth. Um, it grounds it in this life anyway, and, and this is the one you want to get away from, so why bond with somebody here like that? You know, if you really want to do this, you bond with the spirit, you become a monk or a nun, and you, you do your spiritual thing in whatever tradition it is. And hopefully it's a safe, healthy environment that, that you join into. But to, to do it with another human being and think it's going to be an ideal union, well, forget it. There is no such thing. You know, every marriage has its problems. And if you put uh, uh, that marriage under the stress of having to be perfect, well, now you've added something which is unreal and uh, inhuman. It's, it's godly. We are not gods. We're not going to reach that state as long as we're alive. Uh, we shouldn't put ourselves under that kind of pressure, and we should never allow a guru to put us under that kind of pressure to become perfect in a perfect union. That's it. Thanks for listening, and uh, enjoy your day.